you for 40 minutes, 40 minutes hopefully, and then some Q&A. Um, I need to stand. As most of you know, I can't talk on sitting down. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about this this book. I, I already kind of um, risked almost overselling this book. Um, I've read a lot of leadership books, and I think I told you before that this book uh, stands, in my opinion, just above every other book. And I'm talking, you could name it, and that you know, as far as how to um, win friends and influence people and all that. And and I think. Um, I think this just, I think you'll see when I give the presentation on, on why, why it's so different. Um, and there's been a lot of other books that come after this to actually quote a lot of this. In fact, I would go so far as to say there's a few terms I'll, I'll share here that you've heard before, but I bet you might not have known that, uh, uh, that they came from Stephen Covey. Uh, okay, so... Just so you know, I want to I want to go over what the goal of this whole session is. The goal of the session is not to go through everything in the book. Uh, these leadership book summary series I do. Uh, the goal really is for me to cover enough of it to where it interests you uh, to read the book. Uh, and. Maybe a little interest in continuous improvement, because when I, I when I read this book, when I was getting my master's uh, that it was an MBA uh, and this really helped me learn that it wasn't just about getting a degree. It was more about the continuous improvement part. So if I can do that, I'm success. And the other thing to remember is that above all things, this is not a quick fix. I think anything that you hear, most everything that you hear that's a quick fix, a quick diet or a quick way to get in shape or quick, you know, those aren't really resilient or sustainable. And, and this is not a quick fix. I mean, there's lots of steps to take. There's lots of things. Um, and with any session you do, just try to pick out one or two that fit with your personality. So that's my goal is to get you interested in, at least in, in this, okay? Okay, so the interesting thing about the way that this book and the way that I'll present this is that uh, this book is presented into, there's a, there's a fairly lengthy introduction, okay? And it's almost a foundation. So it's like, there's an introduction I'll do, which is like the foundation. And then there's the six habits and then and then one habit. There's seven habits total, right? So uh, we'll go over that in that point. It's it's important to do the foundation because to get an understanding of this is, and you'll understand this at the, hopefully at the end, is why it's so important to get the understanding of the foundation. Because understanding the habits and what they are isn't very hard. But it's hard to do anything with them if you don't, if you don't, have a paradigm shift to we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so that's why the uh, the intro is so is so important. I'll do my best. I'm going to try to write on these slides to show you some things that'll that'll bring elements together. Now, um, I'll try to write an M for management and then an L on items that are um, related to either management or leadership. OK. Um, there is a huge difference between management and le leadership, and we'll discuss that difference here and where it where it is uh, in these in these habits. Now, maybe you know the difference between management and leadership. I didn't when I graduated from college. I didn't know the difference. I thought they were the same. Management and leadership, they're the same, right? They go together. It's almost like QAQC. They're all the same, right? Well, it's not. So in the overview, we'll go over basically what what is called a maturity continuum try to explain that. We'll go over the, the difference between M and L. Uh, and then finally, what is a habit by an operational definition type? So, And you'll see that there is some symmetry to this. Now, this I didn't get from Covey. Just from reading this and presenting, I definitely see some symmetry in the steps. And that's why I, I break it up into six plus one, or I would even say three plus three plus one. So the first three habits are private victory, and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then we'll discuss the public victory. OK, and then when we get an understanding of that, it's it all gets wrapped up in this seven habit and how that how that helps. So that's kind of the 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 table contents, if you will. All right, so let's start building this foundation. OK, so paradigms and principles. Again, I didn't know what paradigm was. Um, I'm not even sure if it's in the dictionary, but um, in order to make these habits 
or really any habit, uh, most habits, uh, stick. Many cases, you have to have a paradigm shift. So what the heck is that? What is it? I can tell you that it's a whole new way of seeing things. Um, but what does that get you? Um, OK, I'm sure you believe me. it's whole. But so Covey tells a little story and I love this story because by listening to this story, I think you understand what a paradigm shift is. So Covey is on is I think he's in New York. He's on the subway and it's a uh, it's a Sunday morning. And it's really quiet on this, this subway. In fact, there's some garbage on the ground because it's so quiet. It's so different than the night before. Saturday night, New York, there was partying on the subway. There was people were going to different bars and restaurants and it was just packed. And, but it was much different, it was very quiet. And this father gets on the subway with three of his kids. And these kids are just, making a mess of things. They're jumping over people, the few people that are there, they're jumping over them, they're, they're, they're throwing the garbage up in the air, they're screaming, they're kind of fighting, and the father is doing nothing. He's just sitting down with his, with his head between his knees, kind of sitting down, slumped over with his head between his knees. Just kind of almost like he's praying, but he's not. He's just like leaning, looking at the ground. And probably he's like, he's, he finally gets so kind of irritated, he says, you know, he goes up to the to the father and he just says, sir, sir, can you please get a hold of your kids? They're disturbing people, they're disturbing me. Can you please get a, get, get a hold of your kids, get, get control of them? And the guy just looking down, you can see he's almost tearing up. He's just, gonna, he's just saying, oh, I just, I just don't know what to do. I can't control them. I just, we just are leaving the hospital and their mother, we just found out their mother died. Now, did you just have something move in your body right there? Did you have, didn't, you know, Covey all of a sudden went from wanting to, you know, tear this guy a new one to wanting to help this guy. All of a sudden he wanted to, you know, console him. He wanted to see, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? I'm just so sorry to hear that. That's a paradigm shift. Is there something that moved in you right there? It changed your entire look at this guy and his kids to what it was. That's a paradigm shift. Okay, so. It's not something you can read and you can make. It's just something that happens inside you. So if these habits and creating habits take that type of paradigm shift, and we'll talk about the difference between want to do and have to do, okay? There's a discussion on how it's an inside-out approach. This is basically is that you have, to, you have to work on you, okay? This isn't about improving other people. This is you. So um, as far as the PPC balance, there's almost too much in this for me to go over everything. But the PPC balance, just to give you an idea, that's the product product capability balance. That's a lot of words there, right? So basically, simply put, the product is what you get. The product capability is capability is what you have to put into something to keep it giving you the P. You have to keep putting into the PC the product capability for it to give you the product. And he tells the story of Ace of uh, Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg. Uh, was the best way to picture that is that, you know, if you're familiar with Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg, basically is uh, the guy, this goose is kicking out golden eggs. Pretty, pretty good deal, right? What's the golden egg? The golden egg is the P, the product, right? Um, but he gets greedy. I mean, the only PC he has to do is feed the damn thing. And he'll keep on kicking out, but he gets, he gets, uh, he gets greedy. What's he do? Aesop's fable. He, he wants all of the eggs. So he chops off the goose's head, reaches down to grab all those eggs, and obviously he killed, you know, killed, <laughs> killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. He no longer got the pee. So there's other examples he, he mentioned about a, a soup owner, a store owner watering down soup and getting, you know, in the in the short run, and we'll describe why that's important, the PPC balance. It's a lot, it's a fancy way of saying basically is you have to invest in yourself in order to get the pee. Okay. And then uh, the next uh, slide I'll talk about is the circle. And this is, there's probably two slides on here. They're probably, if you get nothing else, get these two slides. And then it's the next slide. It's the circle of concern and the circle of influence, okay? So what is that other than looking a little like a Japanese flag? Um, if you can understand this, uh, you'll make decisions uh, that will improve your life, basically. Is, is We have two ways of approaching life is 
we have a circle of influence is what you can control. And then you have a circle of concern, which is what you can't control. So a circle of concern is your boss is a jerk. You're uh, sorry, Ryan. You got hit by friendly fire. Your boss is a jerk or your wife doesn't understand you, um, you know, or, you know, my my uh, my, you know, my job is too far away or uh, then you have then you have uh, the circle of influence. Actually, the job is too far away. It could be a circle of influence. And that, that's that's what you can improve. OK, now, the interesting thing about this is. Whatever circle. You focus on grows. OK, so if you focus on the circle of concern. It gets bigger. You're focusing on your boss is really a jerk and he really treated you poorly and your your baseball team, you know, they won't ever let you play or you, it grows. What's it doing? It's moving farther away from you. Even more out of your control. Well, what if you focus on what you can control? Well, your circle of influence grows. It starts growing. Now, what's growing your circle of influence? That's that's working on things you can control. When your boss asks you to do something, do it and then maybe do a little more. And all of a sudden you'll get more influence. He'll want to come back to you. He or she will want to come back to you. So so as you focus more on your circle of influence, you can control your diet, your exercise, your continuous improvement. It, it'll grow and grow. Until you have much more control of your life and others. Now, the fact is. It'll grow. It will never get to the same location as your circle of concern. Why? Because there'll always be things that you can't control, right? There'll always be some things you can't control. But if you focus on your circle of influence, it'll get pretty damn close. A little bit about the maturity continuum. OK, so. The maturity continuum basically is that this the steps and you'll see in there. That's where I say the symmetry is that the maturity continuum basically shows your growth as a person, as a development, everything you do. It's, it, this is growth. And we'll cover a little bit of dependency. That's you. Dependency is you like when you're a little kid, you know, you're everything is your dependency is, you know, a little baby knows nothing. There's nothing more selfish than a baby, but it's not their problem. They, they only they only cry because it's the whole world is about them. They cry because they want to be fed, right? As you grow, you realize that, you know, uh, you don't you can't be dependent your whole life, right? So then there's the the independency. That's the I. So the I is basically um, that's when you go away to college or you move away from your parents and you become you become independent. You're your own person. You're your own boss, right? At least within certain areas. And then the independent interdependency, which is the we. So you'll find out that these steps really don't move you from dependency to interdependence, independency. It really moves you from the independency, which, you know, you're pretty good. You do what you do, but to interdependency and that's the difference between between you because you're a pretty darn good engineer to we and this is the team. This is how you make everybody better, including yourself. And in order to do this. You have to first have the private victory. And that's actually the first three steps, the first three habits. That's habits one through three. Not a divide sign. <laughs> Sorry. And then the public victory, which is the steps four through six. And then you still have that habit seven hanging out there. OK, so that's that's how this is kind of built up. So think that you, private victory, public victory, and then you wrap it up. OK, just a couple more slides on this foundation. It's a lot of it I get, but this is probably the, the foundation is actually poor, probably more important than the habits themselves because you can read the habits anywhere. Um, so management and leadership, right? I told you I'd try to keep it and try to give a simple make sure that whenever we're talking about a certain habit, is it a management habit or is it a leadership habit? So we'll try to think that. So management. Um, the best way that I can differentiate between the two is if you look at the bullets, right? So um, I did see some actually alignment in these when I was going through this after a few years of, of giving these presentations and, and, and rereading this book several times is 
management is basically how to get things done and leadership is basically the uh the knowing what to what to have done so uh the best way to explain the difference there is again another little story really brief story that covey talks and and i love this one too is uh, you got a bunch of uh there's a bunch of people hacking through the uh the african rainforest with machetes and they're hacking away and they're moving, making pretty good pace. Actually, they're whacking. They're, they've actually got people that are doing training on how to how to how to hack at at, at uh, vegetation. They've got um, they've got people that are sharpening their machetes. They've got training seminars. They've got all these things that are helping them get better at what they do. Um, and they're making really good projects. They're whacking their way through the, this forest. Right? There's one guy that climbs the top of the tallest tree. He looks out, he looks out, <laughs> he looks down at them and he screams at them, wrong forest. Okay, so they were moving fast, but they weren't going in the right direction. So that's the leader. So simply put, the managers know how to do things. The leadership knows the, the what or where to do. So if you look at the alignment that I saw, just I put... Again, this this part isn't really Covey, where I, I see kind of efficiency lining up with effectiveness in that you can be efficient with things. You have to be effective with people, right? Leaders have to lead people. You're not going to lead a thing. Now, you should know this one. Management is all about, not all about, but primarily about the left brain. Right. Engineers are very, very strong left brains. We're very technical. We're very. Um, uh, we get into the weeds, the minutia, the the preciseness, the exactness, the left brain, the management, the right brain. The leaders have the stronger right brain. So that's the artistic side, believe it or not. That's the the crazy out of the box thinking the, the, that's the right brain. And one of my missions, for those of you that, that were my students at San Diego State, you know that this is something I've always covered. I've said, if I do nothing else, I'm going to just try to grow a little bit your right brain. We still need strong, strong left brains. Trust me, engineers are arguably save more, not, I've seen save more lives than all the doctors put together. Engineers as far as maintaining life on this earth. So we need engineers. We need those technical. But um, we, if you can have a little bit of, of right brain, it helps you to you change into that leadership. And then, you know, then again, management, you can manage things. You cannot manage people. You need to lead people. So you can see a little bit of a difference there. Okay, so this is the last one before we start just getting into habits. We're actually gonna go through the habits pretty fast. But, uh, so what is a habit? Well, the habit is, in his operational definition is, the overlapping of skill, knowledge, and attitude. So what is that? So skill is effectively, skill is the knowing how to do something. Knowledge is basically knowing the what to do. So it's how to do, what to do, what's attitude? Attitude would be the want. To do. And sorry about my pen writing, my handwriting. So if you have the, you know, how to do something and you know what to do and you want to do it, that's a habit. But a paradigm shift may, may be required, likely would be required. If somebody's telling you you have to do something, that's not going to be a habit for you long. You'll do it for a while. Why? Why will you do that that thing for a while? Because you have to do it. Why? Because you have to do it. They're making you do it. As soon as that person goes away, uh, it's not going to last very long. And what I love about this, for those of you that know me well, I love Venn diagrams. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Venn diagrams. And uh, this is a good one right here. So this is the, the want to do, is the knowledge, or rather what to do. You need to know how to do it and the desire, the want to do. And if you have those, you have a habit. So you can, you know, I can, 
I can want to play basketball because I love it. I can know how to play basketball. I know it. I've watched it. I've played on teams. I've played on leagues. I played, you know, but do I have the skills to play in the NBA? No. <laughs> so that's not going to work. You know, or you could, you could, you know, you could be, um, as far as engineering, you could, uh, you could, you know, you can have uh, the skills to do it. You could uh, have the knowledge. You know how to do it. You went to school. You've you've taken internships. You've training. You really want to do it? Yeah. That's something you have to find out. That's one of the reasons. If you remember, part of this is related to a little bit of our discussion. Actually, a little bit earlier today is doing that that individual that uh, SWOT analysis of yourself, finding out you know what you really want to do. But if you can bring that together, that's why I've, that's why the paradigm shift is is maybe needed. Because in order to get the desire, you may need the paradigm shift. This is really the one that is probably the most is where you need the paradigm shift. And we'll talk a little bit about maybe how to get that paradigm shift. Because you can, from a certain perspective, you can actually kind of make yourself have a paradigm shift. It's not going to happen just by nothing happening, right? Um, it's not manipulative either. If you think about things in a certain perspective, just like that story on the subway, you could have a paradigm shift. And if you have that, this is no longer work, right? It's no longer work because you want to do it. So I've, I've told many people and probably several of you here is that I like what I do. I hope you do. Um, I tell people that you can't hate Mondays. I have no problem with you liking Fridays and Saturdays better than Mondays. So do I. But I don't hate Mondays. I, you know, it's just, it's, I like what I do. So, you know, if you like what you do, you'll never work another day in your life. Now, that may seem, you know, an exaggeration, but, um, but if you think about it and, uh, and you like what you do, then uh, it's a good place to be in. So, and it's not just that it's a good place to be in, it'll be a habit. And if it's a habit, it'll be sustainable. And it will have resiliency. And there's no way to do habits unless they're those. So that's it. That's the foundation. Now we're going to go over the habits. Okay. So I know that was a big, but and the habits are probably and are going to go pretty fast. So we're going to break up the, the habits in the first three, the second three, and then habit seven. So the first thing, remember we talked about the uh, the the first you got to have the private victory before you can have the public victory, right? You gotta have the I, the dependency, the inter, uh, independency, and then you can then you can work on a team. So the first three habits are be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first. So what do those mean? So one by one. So be proactive. So, so being proactive, you heard that word a lot. Um, what does it mean? Well, proactive people work on their own circle of influence. I'm going to go back one because I've got to put an M and an L. Looking at these, um, begin with in mind. We're going to talk about that's going to be a leadership habit and put first things first as a management. And you'll see why when I explain it. So, so uh, proactive people work on their circle of influence. What, so what, what's the inverse of that? What do reactive people do? I guess since you're all muted, it's rhetorical, but. If proactive people work on the circle of influence and what they can control, reactive people work on that <laughs> circle of concern. You know, they, they, they complain about, you know, uh, things that they can't control. They complain about their boss. They complain about uh, their uh, environment. They complain about things that they can't control. Um, those are reactive people. Proactive people bring their own weather. I don't have enough time to really go over a story, a little story he tells there, but it's about how... Um, uh, well, I, I really don't have time to tell a story. If I maybe stay after class, we can cover that. But it basically tells you that basically you, you even in bad situations of bad weather, you can still have a great time with your family. Because when you get together for Thanksgiving, it's about being with family. It doesn't matter if it's raining. But that's an oversimplification. But that's kind of. The important thing on this slide really is don't be a victim of determinism. And I can really relate to this because I really get frustrated with our American culture in that have you ever heard? I, I really believe part of our American culture is this this, this uh, victimism. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Well, what what are those characteristics? Of? Obviously, 
circle of concern, right? So don't be a victim of determinism. So what is that? So determinism, there's three types of determinism. There's genetic determinism, there's psychic determinism, and there's environmental determinism. You can see how these are all those things that you can't control. Genetic is, is well, you know, um, uh, my, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, my, my dad had a bad temper. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I got a, I got a bad temper. That's just how I am. That's, it, it's my, it's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you believe that you have a bad temper because you're Irish. You will always have a bad temper. That is the clearest indication of self-fulfilling, uh, prophecy. Psychic is that you're not smart enough. You believe that there's, there's the psychic comes from determinism. It's like from Freudian basically covers that you were born this way is that you were going to, um, but it's more with the mind. And then environmental determinism is it, it's not your fault. It's not your fault that you have the job you have. It's not because of all those things, because you didn't have enough money to pay for college. And uh, that could be fact. And that's not, that's a tough one, right? But there are ways that if you don't focus on you not having the resources, because if you focus on you not having the resources, because that's your environment, you don't, you know, is uh that'll always hold you back that doesn't mean it's not there that doesn't mean you don't have money but if you don't think about that and you think about what you can control you'll find a way so those are those determinisms is don't so if you do that those are all characteristics of reactive people and those are the people that end up going nowhere um, or not very far so the important thing to take away is is that there is a there is a gap between stimulus and response. And that's why he breaks down the word response is, um, as far as uh, responsibility is, is your ability to respond. And so the stimulus is that bad thing that happened to you. You still have the control to respond. And this is such a powerful paradigm shift I had years ago because, um, you guys probably don't know this because it was a long time ago I, I handled this one. I used to be a road a rage uh, road rage driver. I don't know if you guys can see that now because I've licked it. I mean, I, I can I can probably see that. Like, I I, I got to tell you, man, it, it, this was so profound to me. Is I my brother lived with me after college, and I would be driving, I'd be screaming at people, cutting me off, and and I used to pound on my steering wheel I, I almost thought i was gonna like break the darn thing because i mean I, and, and my brother looked at me my brother my dad had a high blood pressure and, and uh and um i think he had a minor heart attack too but um he had really and my brother just said jamie you're you're gonna kill yourself you're gonna you're gonna end up dying from this and i made i made a conscious decision to not be so the stimulus and response those people cutting me off those things that were happening and uh it didn't happen overnight but I started listening to music more. I started, you know, I did certain things. I can't get into how I did it, but I did it. Okay. And this happened to me just a few years ago. Well, quite a few years ago now. I was pulling out of our office and I was heading north on the 163. And you know how the 163 heading north on the 15, it kind of merges in as you're turning, as the whole freeway is curving to the right. What happened was, um, as it merged to the, the cars that came off of 52, this truck started coming into my lane and um, it surprised me. And I just really quickly went to the left and I cut this motorcycle driver off. 100% my fault. There's no doubt about it. Um, I didn't mean to do it. I mean, it was reaction to this truck and this motorcycle driver was flipping me off and he slowed down and he was jawing at me. And, and I have to tell you, I had this sense of peace in that that was me years ago and I felt bad for him, not me. I thought I felt, I felt like it was like, um, man, I'm glad I'm not him. Uh, because that's a guy that's, that's struggling, <laughs> you know? And so that's the idea of this. You do have a control of stimulus and response. It's not going to happen tomorrow. That's that paradigm shift. You, so, but the good news about this whole fancy word pair is if you can do it and put the time in, it doesn't, it's not work anymore. I know, I, I'm telling you right now, I no longer one bit struggle with road rage. It's even, it is not even a part of my personality anymore. And I'll talk to you a little bit when we talk about habit seven. Uh, remind me if I don't. Okay.
OK, so. So be proactive. All right, so. Habit number two is. Begin with the end in mind. Now, I know I've talked to you several of you and I know I've talked to my class. But so this is a leadership habit. So why is it a leadership habit? Think about it. Bring in with the end in mind, right? That's trying to see what forest you're in or what direction you should be in the, in the forest. You got to see where you need to be. This is what leaders do. There's not even there's some leaders don't even know how to do certain things, but they have good vision. They know where to go. They know. And and this is what I was just telling my um, I was telling my team leaders when we're doing business planning is and I even told I told my leads group. I said people think they can't tell the future. I don't subscribe to that. I do not subscribe. You can tell the future. You can't know exactly what the future is doing. But if you think, if you plan, if you trend, if you see trends and you read it and you're knowledgeable, you can pretty close tell the future. I'm telling you, when you guys want to talk to me later, I will. I'm, I'll try not to brag. I will tell you where I told the future because now that's in the past. And uh, I was pretty close. And but it takes effort. And that's what leaders do. They, they look at trends. They look at they look at where things are going um, and they project where things could go. So. But as far as in this context is is habit number two. Remember, habits one through three, we're still going over the private victory, right? So in order to do that, you need to have that personal leadership. You're not going to lead others until you can lead yourself, until you can get away from those um, self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, you can get away from focusing on things you can't control. You need to find your own map. Now, the thing that Covey talks about is another great little story, and I think I told a few of this, is write your own. I'm ruining the story. <laughs> uh, write your own epitaph. Basically, he tells a story of, have you ever, um, you're young, so hopefully you haven't been to too many funerals. Um, I'm older than you. I've been to more funerals. It just happens. And you will go to more funerals. But um, I've been, to, you know, have you ever been to a funeral that uh, is really, really crowded? Tell a story about a guy that goes into, imagine that you go to a funeral and it's just packed. I don't know if you've gone to church on Christmas or Easter. If you don't get there early, you're standing outside. The doors are open. You are not only not sitting down, you're standing, you're standing outside. And so imagine yourself at this funeral and you're, you're kind of frustrated because, because uh, uh, you're standing and you're standing outside. You're kind of kind of pissed at yourself you didn't get there earlier but anyway somebody comes up from the guy that died um and he, from his church and speak, talks about what a great person he, he was and how spiritual he was and how he always tried to do the right thing in god's eyes and then somebody from his work comes and says you know what just tell us about how great this person was always did what he said he was going to do was always on time always kept their commitments and when they didn't they apologized just a great worker and then somebody from their community it was somebody from maybe their community group and says that, you know, this person always helped the community and always did this. And then it slowly becomes apparent to you that you're at your own funeral. You don't get any more end in mind than that. Think of what you want people to say your eulogy, at your eulogy, at your funeral, and live your life that way. That is your map. And I guarantee if you think of that, you are going to donate your time more. You're going to think of others more. You're going to do things because you're going to have that end in mind. And I think that was that was something that touched me too because whenever I want to do something that's more um, short-sighted, the P, I want the product. I want the dollars now. I want the um, I want the uh, um, uh, the the new job description now. I want the promotion now, or do I want to put, you know, the PC and, and put the things into it and the other things come. So uh, that's in the mind. OK, so assuming that you have your own personal end in mind and 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 that's like setting your goals and, and doing a SWAT and, and is you got to put first things first. So what would this be? This would be the. This is a management step. So if you know where to go because you think on the ends in mind. Now you need to know how. So the, the how is to to do personal management. So instead of personal leadership, this is personal management, and this is this is determining what the steps to take to have that awesome eulogy, to have that thing that you want, that life that you want to live, um, and then you got to figure out the steps to take. So. You seeing seeing a pattern here? Step six. What is this? Maybe this is your IDP we've talked about. 
individual development plan, your IDP, your goals, your, you know, I told you there were two slides I really wanted you to focus on. The next slide, time management matrix. And this is the second slide. If you take anything away, it's this slide right here. This is how you, this is how you get the M. This is how you get the steps. If you can follow this. Now there's a lot of words in here. The time management matrix, and I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, Kavi came up with this is activities that you do fall into one of four boxes. It's either urgent or not urgent. So it's either urgent or not urgent. Or it's it's either important or not important. So this isn't about trying to figure out what boxes everything is, but it's getting to know there's there's a trick to this. There's an absolute trick to this. The trick is, you know, if you look at the, what's urgent, you've got those those crises that call from the field that your engineering design is screwed up and you need to change or you need to figure out an RFI that you know, that's uh, and and we all know those people that are always seem to be in what I call or try to do this, the fire quadrant. Oh gosh, that was his attempt to make a fire. The fire quadrant. They're always in that quadrant. They're never out of that quadrant. Then you've got the things that are urgent, or I'm sorry, the things that are not urgent, but they're important. So um, those are those things that, um, well, let me come back now. I come back to, so go go down to the, the ones that's not important and urgent. Those are those things that, that are, uh, that are interruptions that are, you know, and I tell people, um, what's a phone ringing? What is a text message? What, what are those things? Those are all urgent because it's ringing in your ear. Text messages is popping up. That's why I'm not a big fan of notifications. Turn notifications off because you have to control your schedule. Don't get interrupted. You can bundle those activities and get back to people in a respectful time, but on your calendar, not theirs. Okay. So some meetings that are a waste of time are, if you look, some popular activities, some interruptions, calls, phone calls. And then we'll go over the things that are not important and not urgent. Well, those are the trivia, that's FaceTime. There's no problem. I, I use FaceTime, not very often, but I mean, you know, I look at it every other month or something. Um, but, you know, those are those things. So, you know, some mail, some email, some phone calls, they're time wasters. Um, these are those things, you know, um, this is, uh, this is playing video games. This is, this is, uh, uh watching too much TV. I want to be clear here. There's nothing wrong with video games or watching TV. The operative word there is too much because you do need your relaxed time. Absolutely. Your relaxed time. We'll talk about later. That's sharpening the saw in a way. And then the non urgent is all those important things that are very, very important but they're not urgent, the hardest thing to do. But those are those things, those are those, uh, those are those PC, see this right here, PC. Here's the trick. The trick is you can't, you can't ignore the urgent and important. You know, though you've, you've got to put out those fires or you'll, you'll burn up and die. There's not much you can do directly to that quadrant, this quadrant right here, the urgent and the important. The trick to this whole matrix is to get rid of this one. If you can get rid of this one, you can slowly shift time from quadrant three to quadrant two. That's the trick right there. Quadrant one, you got to do the fires. Quadrant four, it's it's that waste of time. You, you and I, you all know what is a waste of time. I don't need to tell you what you're, you're wasting your time. You all know it. So you, you don't focus on four. You don't focus on one. You focus on shifting just little bits of time out of three into two. Just little bits at a time. And so what will happen is, is what, what is what is you even listening to this session right now? That's quadrant two. What is you going to the gym? Is is it urgent that you go to the gym? Is it is it is it urgent? No, it's not urgent. It's important. Do you eat right? Eating right isn't urgent. Is it important? Yes. It, but it's the hardest thing. And why is it the hardest thing? Because it's not pressing on us. Non-urgent things are not pressing on us. So setting your goals doing this damn IDP or whatever, you know, those are all, none of those are pressing on you. 
I can show you tricks on how to do it, but that's a different session altogether. But if you and and just so nick away a little bit out of maybe maybe tell you tell uh, tell your boss. Sorry, Brian, you got hit by that one. That you can't make a meeting because you know you know there's certain things. Some meetings you don't have to go to every meeting. You don't respect you tell them a reason why because you want to work on something that's that's more important. Don't pick up the phone. Let it go to voicemail. Check it as soon as check it as soon as it, the, the, it stops ringing. So it's not urgent. You do need to test to make sure it's not urgent. But once you determine it's not urgent, then you do it on your time. Okay, so that's the trick. That's the whole trick. Take away from, and I actually did a different diagram on this because I, I give a session on just this matrix, a whole 50 minute session on just this. And I do this graphically, or if this is graphically, you remember, you can't work on the urgent. This goes down. This gets, see this quadrant gets smaller and smaller. So does quadrant three. Remember, quadrant one is getting smaller because indirectly. This one gets cut out, and what happens here? This one gets bigger. So it's an asymmetrical box now. Looks like that. That's the trick right there. Little little parts at a time. All right, now the public victory. And yeah, do a time check. Oof, I don't get about 10 more minutes. Um, okay, the, the, the public victory is basically think win-win, first seek to understand, and uh, then to be uh, understood. I'd say probably the most important is this one and it is a hard one hard one for me i can tell you that okay so paradigms of interdependence now we've, we've got the we've got the private victory you're your own master mastery over self you know you're doing the right things to improve yourself paradigms of interdependence this is the relationship now you're trying to build the team and you're trying to uh, get that relationship with others because you need them and they need you right so the paradigm of interdependence it is and i'll try to give you this is if you've heard the emotional bank account. Critical perspective. Think of the emotional bank account as a bucket of water. Okay? Emotional bank as what you have with other people. If you have the emotional bank account full, you have a good relationship with somebody. How do you do that? You make deposits. You thank people. You keep your commitments. You clarify expectations. You apologize. You be humble. You're nice to people. Uh, you put them first every now, you know, when it's appropriate. When you do that, that emotional bank account is full. That bucket of water is full. And guess what? Here's the good news. There's a couple of good news here, news here. Is that you can screw up. You can be late to a meeting. Heaven forbid you can break a promise. You don't want to do that. But you can screw up as long as the bank account has water in it because you can take withdrawals. What happens if you take a withdrawal and it's not full? Break a promise when you've got no, nothing emotional bank account. Be late to one meeting when you've got nothing in the emotional bank account. It'll just dig in and, and, and just, it'll, it'll sever the relationship. You've got to keep emotional bank account full. I'm not saying I'm not promoting we take withdrawals. I'm just saying you're human. You can. OK, and here's here's it. Here's the problem. And the good news is that if you see people every day, your spouse or your kids or you see your workmates every day, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's a little hole in this darn thing. What is it? What am I telling you right now? Is that you can't give somebody flowers, thank them, keep a commitment, make it. You can't do that on then. Okay, I'm good. I'm good with that person. And uh, you know, it's got a little leak in it. You have to continue making those deposits. It's got a little leak in it. Okay. One other, one last thing I'll say as far as good news is kind of you can test this. You can test this one. Conversely, if you stop seeing somebody because they moved to Florida, and you um. And you just, for some whatever reason, you kind of lose distance from them. There's no hole. There's no hole. If you, if they left to Florida and you had a full bank account and you do nothing for seven years and they drive back, they fly back, he thinks it's still full. They'll remember you as an awesome person. So you can test that too. Um, I have. Habit number four. Four wrapping um okay oh so habit number four so is is think win win so 
the scarcity mentality versus the abundancy mentality. So the best way I explain this is, is uh, the think when win is, is, is a leadership habit. Why do you think it's a leadership habit? It's a leadership habit because uh, win win is the end is you're looking for that win win solution. So um, there are people out there that have the scarce mentality and there are people that have the abundance mentality. And that doesn't mean if you have one or the other, you can work on it. But the idea is to have the abundance mentality. The best way to picture that is I was one of seven kids in my family and we got pizza every now and then. Do a little pepperoni pizza here. I'm telling you, if you didn't eat fast, you got one piece. Okay. The abundance mentality is, that is the scarcity mentality. The abundance mentality is that you can make the pie bigger. And you've got to have that mentality uh, when you're working with people. Is this not that if I, if I don't get, if I don't get mine, you know, if you get yours, I won't get mine. That's that there's no problem with you getting promoted. You get everybody else promoted in your office. There's a way to make it bigger. Uh, in order to do this, this is the four paradigms of interaction, human interaction. And this is where we go over the four. I, I do a whole session on this, so I can't spend a whole lot of time on this because this is literally, this is, we cover this in like four hours, four or five hours on the core PM training. But the idea is to think win-win. And the best way I can ex to really describe this is that, because um, it's a lot, but I would just say, think every time that you're working with somebody is to make the pie bigger. You know, it's not about you getting a raise and somebody else getting a raise. No, it's about work with each other to both get a raise. If you both grow and grow our company and grow your relationships, everything else will grow with it. You've got to have that mentality. and so. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this um, habit, but uh, you've heard it before and we can, you can ask questions if you want afterwards, but because um, there's a lot I can say on this one. But so um, the best way I can think of that is just that that pie analogy. So wrapping things up here. Habit number five. I told you this is probably one of the most important. So this is a management. Habit. Because it's a how to do something. I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's really, it's just, it's hard to do. It's, it's seek first to understand and then to be understood. I, those of you that know me and know that I work on this, but I struggle with this. I, I do a lot of talking, but I do shut up every now and then. And when I do, I, I'm focused on listening to people. I try, 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 but deny the temptation to go first. Empathic listening, um, try not to think that everybody else is when you think, if everybody else is is like your your perspective is theirs, it's not. Um, there's he's a, he he goes into what's called the Indian talking stick. By the way, I had read that years ago. I didn't even realize the Phoenix Stadium is called the Indian is called talking stick stadium or something. So if you, I've done this a few times, it hasn't always been successful, but it has been mostly successful. I did. You know what? I'll say it's almost always been successful, except when I tried it with my sister. <laughs> the Indian talking stick. Um, I did it with keys. Basically, the Indian talking stick, and and Google this later, is is the Indians did this. I think the Navajo Nation is basically you have a stick, you have it. The person talking has the stick. The other person does not get the the talking stick until they've 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 repeated what that person said in their own words. You can't just repeat them word for word. And then that way, and once that person says, "Okay, you understand me," then you get the stick and can talk. That's the Indian talking stick. And he talks about how that actually helped our people that wrote our constitution. They actually used that mentality. That, I didn't know that. At least that's what Covey says in his book. So, um, but anyway, so that's, you first need to try to understand. He talks about it, about, um, uh, is that it's, well, I can't go into that. There's just not enough time, but um, he talks about the, um, the want desire for people to be understood is damn near as close to it's just above breathing and eating and he tells a story and if you're familiar with maslow's a hierarchy of needs it is a high need and the key is if people really feel under, understood they are opened up to listen to you synergize okay so you've done all this you're thinking we've got the right paradigm you're thinking win-win you're listening to other people you're getting a listen to too then synergize 
the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 or more. This isn't this isn't a joke. This is real. You put two horses next to each other. You put you put uh, you put a horse pulling a cart. They can pull so many pounds. You put another horse pulling a, pulling a cart. You can pull about the same amount. You put those two horses together pulling the same court. They can cart. They can pull like multiples more. OK, so. Value, how do you do this? you value the differences. And when I talked about the SWOT analysis, remember I told you about a little bit of the the uh, the fallacy of, you know, always work on your weaknesses. No, sometimes work on your strengths. Teamwork is getting somebody to their strengths complement your weaknesses and your weakness, your strengths complement their weaknesses. That is the that's the ingredients of a high functioning team. So he calls that the complementary team. You don't have to be a good writer, a good reader, a good orator, a good draft. You don't. You have to be good at something and get other people to, and then you'll beat those other teams that are all good quarterbacks. You don't want a football team with everybody's a good quarterback. You need somebody to run, you need somebody to block, and that's that. that. And so, um, in order to make this all happen, it's not all la la land. You've got to have high level of trust and cooperation. And there's a whole book that I'd love to do with you guys called the speeder, the the uh, it's called the uh, this uh, the speed of trust written by Stephen Covey's son, Stephen Covey's son, um, not Stephen R. Covey. I believe he has a different middle initial. It's a great book called the speed of trust. Wrapping this up and we're right at the 55, but we started five minutes late. Sharpen the saw. So you've done all this. What is sharpen the saw? Sharpen the saw is the PC, the product capability. That's the, you have to strengthen the body, mind, heart, and spirit. You've got to exercise. You've got to, you've got to read. You've got to improve. You've got to increase your knowledge. Your heart, you've got to be compassionate. Work about thinking on other people. Your spirit, think about things that you, um, well, I won't go into spiritual, but you know, you don't have to even be religious to have, to have, to have you know to have that spirit so you work on these you build these and these help you on the other six habits okay and i'll leave you with this uh and how he how he how he explains sharpening the saw okay so he walks up you walk you imagine yourself walking up to a guy or um tell, well he tells a story about a guy who's who's sawing a tree down and he's and he's just sawing away at this tree he's going back and forth and he's he's going real fast the guy's buffed too he's got a really and so he's going back and forth and he's going and he just seemed working in, in it's a big tree. And you're all going, man, you, how long have you been working on that thing? He says, I've been working on it like six hours. My gosh. He's sweating. He's going, he's going, um, he goes, <laughs> why, why don't you sharpen the saw? I go, don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I'm busy. So well, you got to find the time. These are the things that are not urgent. You have to find the time. This is quadrant two. Remember the trick? Quadrant two, PC, not urgent. You've got to be able to do this. Pick away at quadrant three. Put a little bit more time. Go to the gym when you don't want to. I could tell you another story about the remembering self, but, um, but I'm running out of time. So that's it. So that's it. So big foundation, basically, obviously. And then we went over the habits individually. So we went, so you got the leader, the habit two is the leadership habit. You know, begin with the end in mind. This is a management, put th first things first. Leadership habit, management habit. And then this is all your PC. Work on yourself, work on improvement. Continue. This is, this is continuous improvement right here. And part, part of you just being, taking an hour of your time and listening to this tells me that you're interested in a person that is wants to work on their continuous improvement. So that's that's it. That's the last slide. Um, I'll ask anybody. You don't have to stick around. Yet. It's you know I took up. I didn't really give you guys ten minutes of Q and A. I'll ask anybody if they want quite if they have any questions. Um, but I took most of the time yapping. Um, are there any questions anybody has? <laughs> took all the time. How do I do this?
this card. I want to see your faces. All right. Well, there's no questions. I uh, I do thank you for coming. Uh, you know, they say in Toastmasters, you almost shouldn't thank people because you're there, you're working for them. But I thank you because by coming to this and doing this, you made me better. You know, and I know these habits, but even going over and saying them again, remind me there's a few I got to work on a, a little bit more. And so the best way to uh, to learn something is to teach it. And that's what Covey talks about. And this will make me work on this a little bit more. So thanks a lot for everybody coming. And I'll stop the recording. How do I do that? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.